I want you to pick a pen and a paper and write about two or three things which are a challenge to you or which have been a challenge to you. Maybe um, since you were born or since you, beca you began to know a few things here and there. It may be the issue of finances. It may be the issue of education. It may be the issue of job. It may be the issue of relationships. Any mountain. Tell your neighbor, I got mountains. Yeah, any mountain, anything which you are thinking. I want you to do it quickly because we have a few minutes to work it out. If you've written them down, maybe finances. That's why it's good to come to church with a pen and a notebook. Amen. It may be the issue for those who are in ministry, the issue of ministry. Yeah. So if you've written them down, let's look at uh, uh, let's look at these scriptures shortly. John five nineteen. John five nineteen. This is what the scripture say. Jesus replied, "I assure you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing." Whatever the Father, that is God, does, the Son also does. Amen? How many of us are sons of God? Sons and daughters of God. Amen? I believe you are, even if some are doubting themselves. But I believe you are. Now, what happens is this. Let's look at these other scriptures. Psalms 37 verse 12 and also Psalms 59 verse 8. Psalms 37, 12, the Bible says, The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. Verse 13 says, But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. What does the Lord do in verse 13? Huh? He laughs at the wicked. For he knows that their day is coming or the day of judgment to them is coming. Psalm 59 verse 8. It says what? Come on, let's read it loud. Oh my God. Oh my God. No, we went to school. We can't be reading like that as a people who never went to school. Come on, let's read it loud. Let's read one, two, three. Let's go. But you, O oh Lord shall laugh at them, you shall have all the nations in derision. What does the Lord do? He laughs at them. Now we, say, we saw earlier on the scripture says, as the father, what the son can do nothing by himself, but he does whatsoever he see the father do what? Do. So what the father does is what the son does. Now our father and our God loves. He looks at the wicked. He looks at the plot of the enemy. Then he loves. Now I want you wherever you wrote those kind of challenges, I want you to cross them like this and then you write the word God. Cross them then write God in capital letters. Amen. Amen. Have you written? Have you done it? Okay, if you came to look for a movie, to watch for a movie, I will tell you, those who have written, God will visit them. That's what I know. Amen. Yeah. Now, it is important for us to love. <laughs> Amen? Because... Our father loves, and you, you are gloomy. So who is your father? You are so serious. Who is your father? Look at your neighbor and ask them, who is your father? God looks at challenges and he does what? 
he loves. The enemies he loves. He loves at them because he knows these are nothing. Now, let me explain something to us. God's laughter is a world splitting. His enemies cower in fear. His friends rise in comfort. His laughter warns cosmic traitors of their impending doom while reminding weak saints that their best is yet to come. God loves for our sake to communicate to us. He loves to give off signals. Signals that are horrible to his enemies and wonderful to us, his friends. God loves to dispel our fears. He loves to remind us that no purpose of his concerning our lives can be thwarted. Praise the Lord. So, loving is important. So, I want you, you are looking at those, your problems, your issues. And I want you to just take a moment, one minute, two minutes, and just laugh at them. Uh, just laugh at them. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yes, love. Love are those things. What are they? Yeah. The way the scripture says, who are thou? What are you, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? So just love are those issues. Uh, those, those are the things which are holding you, which are making you to be sad. Oh. <laughs> uh, Brother Angela, add to those things. Oh. No, 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 no. Yeah. They can't hold you. You are a son of God. Our Father loves. So it's important for us to do what? Amen. Okay. I know our time is running, but I want us, let's get into today's lesson briefly. And we are talking about spiritual disciplines. And I believe one of them is what we have practiced. Yeah. One of them is what we want to practice. So please, as you go home, write the more and just... Sit and laugh at them. La oh, who are you before me? Amen? Spiritual disciplines. And we are looking at practices that make your faith strong. Practices. We are beginning in the next maybe two or so months. We will be looking at spiritual disciplines. Both campuses in the Wednesday and also Sunday services. So please, let's tune ourselves that we may get the most from this, that we may grow into this, we may practice them more. So, just as every athlete must train to win, every Christian must make their faith strong through spiritual disciplines. Nobody can sit on the couch and eat chips for months and hope to compete. We are now watching athletes who are running in different uh, track fields and so forth. And those guys, they weren't eating that chicken that rolls and chips all day long and then they went to compete, and they are winning gold or silver or some metal. No. They had to cultivate a certain discipline in their lives. Now, in, when we look at spiritual disciplines, these are practices that make your faith strong. They make your faith strong. Just as there is no faith that does not act, so there is no act 
without some plan. You can't act without a plan. As we are saying, just as faith, there is no faith that does not act. Faith without action is dead. Therefore, also, if you don't plan, you will not act. You won't act. So don't just think godliness happens. It comes by the grace of God. It comes by spiritual disciplines that are the vehicle that carries us on. Praise the Lord. So my prayer is that you and me, we will daily make priorities of how to move forward through the spiritual disciplines. Now, the best athletes are intensely disciplined. Anyone that competes in running, they are intensely disciplined. They follow strict, a strict diet and exercise regimens to beat their body into peak physical condition. So when the game is on the line, they are ready. We know this is true for our physical condition, but there is a disconnect with how we think about our spiritual condition. Now, I want you to get this. When some of us, we were training to play, because I was a, a, a player some, in some camps, some time back. Now, what happened is we could wake up very early, because when you are in high school sometimes, because of studies, you are to wake up early, you go for road, yeah, you do some road work and so forth. You and your team guys, we run like that, or you go to the truck, you run severally before you go into the field to begin some now easy kind of things, exercises. You discipline yourself. And you don't do it once, but it's like you do it over and over again, so that when the game comes, or the time for you to play comes, it's easy for you now to defeat the opponent, or to play against the opponent. So, and you know, we weren't competing so that we may get something, but that was a lifestyle of the game. A lifestyle of the game. So you as a believer, we as believers, we have a game to play. The game of being a believer in Christ. A Christian who is progressing, who is moving on into the things of God. So there is a lifestyle for you to cultivate. There is a discipline for you to cultivate in life. If at all you will amount to what God wants you to be. But the sad reality is that many Christians are unfit because they are undisciplined. Now look at your neighbor and say, that is not me. Yeah. We need to be disciplined. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Nobody drifts into discipline. Just as the undisciplined body becomes luckish and far, the un Disciplined spirit becomes weak. If we don't have that spiritual discipline, we become weak Christians, weak believers. Now, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, he says, Train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is for some value, Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So Paul is encouraging Timothy here that train for you to achieve godliness, then you need spiritual training. You need spiritual disciplines to be in place. Praise the Lord. Now, this fast is the cornerstone of the spiritual disciplines 
because it spells out their purpose. Training for godliness. Training for godliness. Amen? Now, a parable is told of a king and his four wives. Maybe you have gotten it somewhere. And it gives us a spiritual lesson which we need to get. Now, this is how the story goes. That once upon a time, there was a rich king who had four wives. I'm not a forgetting for any brother here when time comes for you to get married to go for four wives. But I want you to get the spiritual aspect of what I'm speaking. Now, he loved the fourth wife the most and adored her with rich robes and treated her to the finest of delicacies. He gave her nothing but the best. He also loved his second wife. She was his confidant and was always kind, considerate, and patient with him. Whenever the king faced a problem, he could confide in her and she would help him get through the difficult times. Now, he also loved the third wife very much and was always showing her off to neighboring kingdoms. However, he feared that one day she would leave him for another. Now, the king's first wife was a very loyal partner and had made great contributions in maintaining his wealth and kingdom. However, he did not love the first wife. Although she loved him deeply, he hardly took notice of her. So one day the king fell ill and he knew his time was short. He was going to die. So he thought of his luxurious life and wondered, I now have four wives with me. But when I die, I will be all alone. So he asked the fourth wife and said, I love you the most. I have endowed you with the finest clothing and showered great care over you. Now that I'm dying, will you follow me and keep me company? No way! <laughs> she replied, the fourth wife replied, and she walked away without another word. Her answer cut like a sharp knife right into his heart. Are you following me? He then asked the second wife, I have always turned to you for help and you've always been there for me. When I die, will you follow me and keep me company? I am sorry. I can't help you out this time, replied the second wife. And the very most, at the very most, I can only walk with you to your grave. Her answer struck him like a bolt of lightning, and the king was devastated. Now the sad king then asked the third wife, I loved you all my life. Now that I am dying, will you follow me and keep me company? No, replied the third wife. Life is too good. When you die, I'm going to remarry. His heart sunk and turned cold. Then a voice called out, I'll go with you. I'll follow you no matter where you go. The king looked up and there was his first wife. She was very skinny as she suffered from malnutrition and neglect. Greatly grieved, the king said, I should have taken much better care of you when I had the chance. Now, this is the moral truth of the story. We all have four wives in our daily lives. The fourth wife is our body. Somebody look at yourself. You are looking smart. You are looking elegant. <laughs> now, we love our body with our first affection. And we devote our life decorating it with exercise, ornaments, and clothes. However, 
no matter how much time and effort we lavish in making it look good, it will leave us when we die. It will leave us. Even if you take two hours carrying all those kind of stuff, you will leave it. The body will leave you when you die. Now, our second wife is our friends, families, and relatives. We love them and trust them. And in exchange, they also offer us comfort and aid when we are in need. But no matter how close they are to us, when we are alive, the farthest they can stay by us is up to the grave. No one, no one among our brothers, our sisters, our relatives, our friends will drop into the six feet with us. Our third wife is our property, our position, and our riches. We expend a lot of our time and attention seeking to accumulate property. But all the things we have gained won't come with us when we die. Alternatively, when the third wife claims she will be remarried after the king dies, all our property is split and offered to others when we die. They go to others. Are we together? Now, our first wife is our spirit. We ignore our souls in search of riches, in search of enjoyment and strength, never knowing that it's only our spirit that goes with us as we die. Sure, we do ought to take care of our bodies, yes, stay well and exercise, we ought also to have a nice time of things for our associates and family, yet we should not forget to take care of our biggest treasure, our spirit. Amen. Please take your greatest care, your spirit. Spend some time alone to meditate, to pray, to render your spirit one with the creator, to seek to be respectful and polite, to dedicate your life for a higher purpose. To be the suffer of other living. Nourish your spirit as it is your only loyal friend. She was skinny, almost like she suffered from malnutrition. Greatly grieved, the man said, I should have taken much better care of you while I could have. So don't regret when this life is over, don't regret. Amen? Begin to take care of your spirit person. So what are the spiritual disciplines? We are today just laying a foundation of what we will be taught in this place. So what are the spiritual disciplines? Now, spiritual disciplines are practices that by design can lead to life transformation. These are practices that leads us, if we practice them, to a transformed lifestyle. They are practices that help us create time and space for transformation. You know, transformation doesn't just come, but it comes when we create time for it. When we create space or give it space in our lives, that's when it comes. So we want our lives to be transformed, to be like that great preacher, to be like that great business person who is a believer, to be like so and so. The thing is we have to create time to practice these disciplines. Praise the Lord. Yeah, there are some books that talk concerning what great men do. Yeah, seven things that great people do or something like that. But I'm not talking that. In other words, it's like these are practices which these guys have established in their life and they do it daily. Spiritual disciplines are the believer's practices 
that aid our spiritual growth as disciples of Christ and deepen our relationship with God. So you and me as disciples of Christ, these are practices that will help us in our spiritual growth. You cannot grow spiritually unless you are practicing them. Unless you are with them. And your relationship also with God cannot grow unless you are practicing them. And God calls us to practice them. To practice them over and over. Amen. Amen. Spiritual disciplines are like training exercises for the spiritual life. So as a spiritual person, you practice them. No one was born with them, but as you are born again, you are initiated into that life whereby you practice them. You now begin to practice them. Amen? Yeah, so, sometimes I, I like watching those guys who are doing gymnastics in the like, competition that is going on. But now I don't have time to watch because my day is full of running here and there, doing a lot of stuff here and there. But I like sometimes to watch because those guys, they have taken time to practice till they can bend. They bend, they are seated down, they bend the head, touches the other side. But don't try it at home if you've not practiced lest we are cold. <laughs> they run, they jump, somersault, do a lot of stuff there up in the air before they land down. Yeah. But you don't practice it. If you've not been practicing it, don't do it. Okay? <laughs> so, we are saying they are like training exercise for the spiritual life. Like physical exercise, we have to choose to do them regularly to feel or see their impact in our lives. Now, the purpose of spiritual disciplines is to deepen our relationship with God. Because they are tools that aid and guide us on our journey in relationship with God. So, I don't know if we can be given a few slides here so that we look just a highlight of them. We have two books which if you can get them that you can look at them because they are there to help us understand these things. There is a book by the name Richard Foster and he has given celebration of uh, the book is Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth. And he gives three areas of those disciplines. The inward disciplines, which he names meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. Those, he names them to be inward disciplines. Then the outward disciplines, he names them to be simplicity, solitude, submission and service. Then also he gives corporate disciplines which are confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. Now, there is another also person or writer by the name Dallas Willard. He has written a book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, Understanding How God Changes Lives. And he gives the disciplines in two uh, kind of aspects. The abstinence and the engagement. And in the abstinence side, he gives us solitude, silence, fasting, frugality, chastity, secrecy, and sacrifice. And in the area of Engagement, disciplines of engagement, he gives us study. In other words, we engage. We have to engage. We engage them. Study, we have worship, we have celebration, we have service, we have prayer, we have fellowship, confession, and submission. Now, the list, when you look at different writers, 
it goes even up to 24 or something like that. The list is so big. So as you can see, there are variations on how these lists of spiritual disciplines are organized and the disciplines that are included. But the important thing is these disciplines have been exercised. They were exercised by the Lord Jesus Christ when you look at in scriptures. And also the saints of old have exercised them with the time. So they are proven to be working, to be helpful. Amen? And so when we practice them, they will also help us. Praise the Lord. Yeah, they will help us. Uh, maybe as you Google sometime, not now, when you Google and you see the ministry of Kenneth Hagen, you will find what we were doing earlier on. He comes just in the service. Maybe after teaching a little bit, he begins to move. And he touches people and people begin to love. They love. The whole service people are just loving. He touches people. Some they fall because of the anointing and so forth. Yeah. So what we are saying is all these things, they are profane. And you find out that people, like in a family where people are happy, people love, people are happy. They live long, they live stress-free, yet they get a lot of issues. But they are happy, they live strong. Praise the Lord. So these things, when they are practiced, they help. A family that prays, it's not just that thing that is written and we put it there. A family that prays stays together or lives together. No. It has been proven. That's what happens. So when we pray, we are praying together. It happens. Yeah. When you study the word, it just builds you up. It's like you open up the river of life to begin to flow in your life and through you because you are studying all these things. So that's why we are saying that we have to make up our mind. We say, I'm going to practice these things. Amen? Yeah. If you began when you were born, you began to be taught to take milk, then you graduated to take porridge, then you graduated to take other stuff that are solid until right now you can take any solid stuff around that is eatable, including sugar cane. Then it, or roasted maize. Then it means you can teach yourself spiritual disciplines till you are doing great stuff for God. Amen. Nothing is hard. Amen? Amen? Nothing is hard. So quickly, in a minute, let's just look at a few of them. Seven disciplines of abstinence or letting go. Now, one of them is solitude. We are just highlighting because we will be taught these things. Now, solitude speaks of Spending time alone with God. Spending time alone with God. It speaks of you taking your time off. It may be early in the morning or late in the evening or something. Or some time in a month you take yourself, you say, I want to go. When you talk to Pastor Beatrice, she will tell you they used to go to Karura and even a paradigm, the other side, and just spend time there. They are praying, they are fasting, and she will tell you God was speaking to her a lot of many things. Spending time alone with God. Amen? Yeah. Then the other one is fasting. Tell your neighbor fasting. Now, we were taught fasting and we practiced it. 
the other time, but it's a practice that we need to do it often and often. I know you are not fasting, but uh, we have, we are not condemning you. We are saying we need to fast. Tell your neighbor you need to fast. Yeah, tell your neighbor food is good. I love it. But we need to pray and fast. Yeah, it's a practice which we need to cultivate. Amen? It's abstaining from food to express our dependence on God. Now, the third one is denial. This is disciplines of abstinence, denial. Now, denial speaks of intentionally denying yourself certain legitimate pleasures to find your sufficiency in God. Uh, like when we go for the encounter, you, de you are denied by force, by fire, not to touch the phone. And you find out that God speaks to you. Yeah? God changes your life. So, in other words, it's just showing if we could deny ourselves some few things, then we could be very far as believers. Amen? Secrecy, number four. La, uh, that, that's living before an audience of one. You are looking at, I'm living before one person who is my audience, and that person is God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, uh, I, I used, when I was living alone, when I wasn't married, I could cook my food and when I swear one duku, praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, you don't eat from the sufuria. <laughs> yeah, which you used to cook. You picture yourself, someone may be having that binoculars or something, and they are focused on me. They are looking, what kind of a man is this? So take a good plate. Yeah, and place it there as if you are serving visitors. Visitors are there. Because you know God is here. Angels are here. They are looking at me. So if you are the guy who says you don't want to dirty utensils in the house. <laughs> and you scoop everything from the sphere. Know that angels are watching. They are wondering, what kind of a man is this? <laughs> Amen? Yeah, there is an audience. Whether we are seeing them or not. Amen? Then number f uh, five, six. Okay, five. We have said secrecy. It's number five. Then number six is simplicity. Simplicity. Now, simplicity speaks of learning to live with less, meeting basic needs with joy and contentment. We will never, you know, our needs will never be met. They always grow. As you grow, your needs also grow. As they increase your salary, your needs also increase. As you get more money, you are... That's why those guys who don't live in contentment or in simplicity, they are grabbing everything. Yeah? They are so corrupt because of what? Just the aspect of simplicity. So we ourselves as believers, we learn to live in simplicity. Amen. Yeah. Amen? So you don't stress yourself. Tell your neighbor, don't stress yourself. Yeah, tell them this. Th tell them I love you the way you are. Yeah. Yeah, and tell them you are so wonderful. Yeah, you don't have to... Yeah, ukue yani mtu wa madeni. Iyo nguo ya madeni. Kila kitu chenye ukonai hata nyuele ni ya madeni. Ah, ah. Tell your neighbor, acha madeni. Simplicity. Yeah. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Number seven is silence. Tell your neighbor silence. Now, silence is talking less and listening more. 
Amen. Talking less and listening more. So being quiet, it's being quiet before the Lord and others. Silence is important, brethren. Amen. Amen. And there are scriptures that are there. And I know in our nation we love to talk, but we need to cultivate silence. Now, please give us that quote even as we pray. Uh, <laughs> there is a quote by a great man there who is uh, Oswald Chambers. He's a great man. And he says that we can all see God in exceptional things, but it requires the growth of spiritual disciplines to see God in every detail. I looked at it and I saw this is great. It requires discipline to see God in every detail. Amen. So, will you cultivate these spiritual disciplines? Will you cultivate? Yeah. So, please, as we go home, because I know you will go home, I pray this prayer to you. That please, go look for a pen and if you lack a notebook, come to me in the course of the week. I will buy you a notebook. But get a pen, get a notebook. So that as we will be being taught these things, you note them down. Amen? Then you go and study. You go and study them. Then you begin to work them out. Then you begin to associate yourself with someone in the church, in our midst, who is also working them out. You begin to team up to work them out, to discuss them out, to move together. And I tell you, we will do great exploits. Because these things, our elders, they have worked them out and it has proved it works. The Lord Jesus Christ worked it out and we love his lifestyle. We love the way he lived. So we can work them out. Amen. Father God, we thank you and we bless you this morning. Our prayer is that, Lord, as we begin to look on spiritual disciplines, we as a church, we as individuals, you will lift us. You will help us to be established in these disciplines. And Lord, we will grow up in our relationship with you. We will grow up, O oh God Almighty, even in godliness for the glory and for the praise of your name. None of us, O oh God, will be weakling in our spiritual life, but we will be strong in our spirit life. We will, O oh God, be like Christ. We will, O oh God, have your semblance in character and in everything that we do. Therefore, Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters here. The Lord be with each and every one of them. Strengthen them. They that are weak in one of the disciplines, we pray for grace and strength upon them. In the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for divine understanding and insight even as we exercise them. And Lord, our cry and prayer is that draw us closer to you in your sweet embrace. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody says amen. amen. God bless you.